Okay, man, I'm lying back. I hope people don't mind. Okay, everybody, see. I think we're live. <laughs> uh, yes, we are live. What's happening, everybody? Welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning, the day after the feast of the Blessed Mother, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was yesterday. So, with us, we have Craig Trulia. Am I pronouncing it correctly? That's correct, yes. Praise God. Greg Trulia, who's now going to give you the Orthodox perspective, the Orthodox understanding on <clears throat> what the Bible and ancient history has taught concerning the Blessed Mother of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. So he has as much time to make his case, and then afterwards we're going to have Q&A. So I'm going to recede into the background. He's going to go, come to the forefront, take as much time as you want. He's not rushed. But if you Thank have you questions, so write them down, and we're going to have Q&A. So in Jesus' name, may the triune God be glorified. May he anoint you. Brother, it's your show. Thank you, Sam. And uh, I won't waste people's time too much with the introduction. I would recommend they watch uh, a previous show with Sam where I give my introduction. I'll just say very quickly, um, my name is Craig Trulia. I am an Orthodox Christian. I belong to the Bulgarian Patriarchate. And uh, I'm an interested layman. Um, what I'm presenting today is not my own personal opinion. We'll be going over um, several books. You can tell they're of recent vintage that go over this topic. Um, but that being said, people aren't interested in the books, interested in what the scriptures and the fathers say. So let's get started. In a recent interview I was watching, Pints of Aquinas, the host, Matt Fraud, said, when the fathers are unanimous on a topic, you can't go against them. And the guest that day was surprise, surprise, Sam. And he went even further. He said, one dissenting voice does not undo a majority. So what if there was a plethora of fathers that taught a doctrine? And what if there was not a single dissenting voice? Now, obviously, we don't need to know every Christian who has ever existed and his belief on a topic in order to understand what are the correct doctrines about Mary, the Theotokos, the mother of God, the bearer of God, right? We just need to know the beliefs of those Christians who actually commented on a topic to know what the teaching of the church always was. Now, the Orthodox doctrines of Mary I will cover today are the unanimous teaching of the saints. I need to be honest and state that only Orthodoxy today affirms and has not altered this unanimous teaching for this reason. I'm, I want to apologize in advance. Um, if what will follow will offend the Protestants and Roman Catholics that are listening to the show. So please do not shoot the messenger. I'm just presenting the historical doctrine of the church. Now, as a preface, being that you're always used to these Western debates, she sinned, no, she didn't sin, you know, um, she was immaculately conceived, no, she was immaculately conceived. People are not used to hearing what how the fathers really talked about this, how the Orthodox Church really talks about this. So let me offer this preface before we get started. It's difficult to present an in-house doctrine to people outside the Orthodox Church. Today is not going to be about convincing you that we are right, but rather teaching you what we believe and what the saints have always taught. Now, there's a lot of debate. So to prevent misinformation, reading text as a whole and in proper context is key. So for this reason, I will provide everyone listening citations. You must do the homework and look everything up. Don't just trust me that I'm keeping things in context. I mean, of course, I think that I am, but you got to do the hard work of looking it up. Now, it's helpful to think of all Orthodox, whether it's Oriental or Eastern Orthodox, believing the same things about Mary as the Roman Catholics do. But because we have a different understanding of original sin, um, it means that we're mostly the same other than the idea that we maintain the Orthodox, that the Theotokos had that sin. She never committed sin, but she had original sin, which is not a sin of commission. Because we are so familiar, um, so because we are so similar, rather, to Roman Catholics and what they believe, and people already know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches on this, I'm going to emphasize how we are different today. Now, everyone hang on to the seats, but I'm going to shoot straight with you right now, right? Orthodox do not portray Mary as somehow more than human. Orthodox venerate Mary, but we lack cultural elements of Western devotions which is probably what you're more used to interacting with when you see this. So we don't have any sacred hearts. 
We don't have frequent apparitions. Doesn't mean they don't exist, but we don't have frequent apparitions. We don't have appearances on toast or in clouds. Um, and we don't have reparations and sacrifices to Mary. Now, oftentimes in these debates, people don't hear about this, but this is something that's legitimately part of Roman Catholic devotion, which is not part of Orthodox devotion. For example, Sister Lucia, who claimed to get private revelations from the Theotokos preceding an apparition in Fatima, Portugal, was allegedly told this by Mary. And quote, when you make some sacrifice, say, oh, Jesus, it is for your love for the conversion of sinners and in reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. All right. And that's a direct quotation. Um, I got that off Genesee which was the first monastery I ever visited in Western New York. It's a Roman Catholic monastery. It's a memorial sermon for the Lady of Fatima. Now, proceeding may sound bizarre, and I'm honestly not trying to scandalize you. But this, this topic becomes so academic that we lose a grip on reality. Orthodox do not have any of the proceeding as part of our piety. So it is important that I point that out that we do not have this in common. The rest of this presentation is going to be very academic. And so we can leave the real world stuff for Q&A. Now, mainstream books from cradle Orthodox clergy, not converts, such as Igumen Gregory, O Full of Grace, Glory to Thee, Father Hasidicus, Jesus Fallen, and there's other books that agree with every aspect of this presentation. This is not my private opinion, but the orthodox consensus. Now, let's begin with some relevant scriptures. Now, the scriptures are about God. The saints, including the Theotokos, are sort of incidental to that story about God and him saving us. So unlike soteriology, like in my last presentation, Mariology in the scriptures, without getting very allegorical, is relatively scanty. So let me start with giving you some scriptures. I don't expect them to convince you, Mr. Audience, um, but you're, this is the context that we're going to understand the teaching the saints. All right. So for one, the scriptures make pretty clear that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. So in 2 Samuel 6, 9, it says, David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the Ark of the Lord come to me? Now, let's look at the par parallel, Luke 143. Um, Elizabeth says to Mary, but why is this granted to me that the mother, my Lord, should come to me? So we see the same sort of thing. Now you go, oh, that parallel is really not close enough to show that Mary's the ark. Well, this gets even closer. And they add some more context to the Orthodox doctrine, which is Mary need to be purified to become God's footstool. Right, The Ark of the Covenant was God's footstool on earth. It's where God is made present on earth. So obviously, when Mary um, had God become the Logos incarnate within her, she was God's footstool. Well, what happened first? If we remember, she was overshadowed. So let's look at Exodus 40, 29 in the Greek. Um, it says the same thing, by the way, in your regular Masoretic text, which the Bible you probably have, in Exodus 40, verse 35, which is this. And Moses was not able to enter to the tabernacle of testimony because the cloud overshadowed it and the tabernacle was filled with the glory of the Lord. Now let's look at Luke 135. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who's to be born will be called the Son of God. So it's the same Greek word. Remember, the Exodus was also translating Greek. They're using the same Greek word for the overshadowing of Mary and the overshadowing of the ark. So clearly, Mary is God's ark. The ark had no stain. It was covered with curtains. If we read in the Old Testament, it's supposed to be carried with rods. The idea was the ark is supposed to be untouched by sinful man. So anyhow, another doctrine that you might have got past you, but it's in the scriptures, is Mary gave birth without pain, which implies she remained a virgin after birth. Now, this sounds wacky. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7 to 8. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child who has heard such a thing. Now, it should be noted, not only there are multiple fulfillments for Old Testament, Old Testament prophecies, obviously like uh Isaiah prophesies that a virgin will bear a child in Isaiah 7, 14, and the immediate fulfillment has to do with the prophetess, which is his wife. Um, however, we know that's about Jesus Christ because the Gospel of Matthew says so. So in the same way, we see Isaiah 66 as a multiple fulfillment. And I want to add this note. 
that we are not more defiled after encountering God in our lives. So God coming to this world cannot have resulted in the Theotokos losing her purity. So it's an extremely important doctrine that she did not lose her virginity um, after birth. Now, Mary died. Scriptures teach this if we accept that the Ark of the Lord is a type for Mary. So Psalm 132.8, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, and the Ark of thy strength. So I'll just repeat because I probably got past you. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Right? The Lord rested. He died. He was, in the, he was dead for three days. rose again. Thou and the Ark of thy strength. So they both rested. So that means we believe that Mary died. It's incontestable. It's in the scriptures. Also, Psalm 116, verse 15. The death of the saints is precious in the sight of the Lord. Now, we have Revelation 12, 14 that speaks of a woman who is bodily assumed, which typologically could refer to Mary. Now, it says this. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Now, lastly, Orthodox believe that the saints, including Mary, intercede for us now. Now, the saints pray for us. And this should go without saving, saying, because Revelation 6.10 says, And they cry with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, read Revelation 6. Those are dead martyrs, right? And they're praying to God. So some people say, well, the saints, how do they hear our prayers? Well, we already know the saints could read, you know, listen to prayers. When Elisha was still alive, um, he was able to know of things that were occurring and being said when he was not in his presence. Let's look at 2 Kings 5, 26. Then he, Elisha, said to him, did not my heart go with you where, when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? All right, so if his heart could follow uh, the Gehazi, I forget the guy's name, when he went to um, the guy who was baptized in the Jordan, I forget his name as well. Um, but if he can know what's going on, can't the saints in heaven divinized by God's energy also know what's going on? It's the same grace, so obviously yes. So to understand the Orthodox doctrine and how we allegorize the scriptures and really get more details, it is necessary to understand the traditions of the fathers, which in the Orthodox Church we consider authoritative. Now, we got to start with original sin. Now, sin is a diseased condition of the will. When I do air quotes, that's a saint. That's not me. Which alienates oneself from God. The alienation from God brings corruption and death, not as an arbitrary penalty, but as a law of nature due to being cut off from God's divinizing energy, which is something we talked about last time. If you want more detail, you could listen to the show we did before. Now, therefore, original sin is not explicitly an overt act, but rather a condition. Romans 5.12 says, As through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So here is how the saints understand original sin. Now, St. Augustine, writing in the 5th century, on original sin, aptly named Book 2, Chapter 3. He's quoting the minutes of the Council of Carthage. So all the bishops in North Africa signed on to this. The bishop, who happened to be St. Aurelius of Carthage, said, I ask what conclusion I have on my part to draw from this man's obstinacy. My affirmation is that although Adam, as created in paradise, is said to have been made immortal at first, he afterwards became corruptible through transgressing the commandment. All right? So corruption comes from original sin. We see this also in John of Damascus, probably one of the most important interpreters of the scriptures in the first millennium, in the Exposition Orthodox Faith, Book 2, Chapter 11. He says, quoting an imaginary conversation between God and Adam, let everything bear for you the fruit of life and let participation in me be the support of your being. For in this way, you will be immortal. All right. And now John Damascus now adds, he's now narrating, he cannot remain incorruptible who partakes of sensible food, i.e. the fruit of sin. Right. So before Adam ate of the fruit, he had participation in God and participation in me. That's what kept him from corrupting. You cannot remain incorruptible when you partake in food, the sensible food, the fruit of sin. John Damascus also, same book, book four, chapter 13. He, who is Adam, transgressed the command of his creator and became liable to death and corruption. So if that's a little clearer for you, there you go. St. Gregory Nyssa, and against Eunomius, book 2, chapter 12, said, Humanity once revolted through the malice of the enemy, 
and brought into brought into bondage of sin to sin was also alienated from the true life. Right? So bondage to sin alienates us from true life, and that's why we corrupt. Also, Greg Nisra, also again, Sunomia's book two, chapter 12. So this is in the same chapter, so it's within the context, same conversation. Of that at least, which is truly passion, which is a diseased condition of the will, he, Jesus, was not made a partaker. For it says he did no sin, neither was guile found his mouth. So the diseased condition of the will, that is a result of original sin. Well, how do we get original sin? Doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure this out. It comes from sex. Um, we know this. It's in Psalm uh, 50. It might be 51 in your Bible, um, where it says um, that I was conceived in sin in my mother. So anyhow, Augustine, on that note, on marriage and concupiscence, book one, chapter 13, writes, Everyone who is born of sexual intercourse is in fact sinful flesh, since that that alone, which was not born of sexual intercourse, was not sinful flesh. Who is that? Obviously Jesus. He was not born of sexual intercourse. St. Maximus the Confessor in the Ambiguo of John 41.17. It's going to be a little wordier. So guys, you got to wear the thinking hats, okay? He became perfect man, having assumed from us and for us and consistent with us everything that is ours, lacking nothing but without sin. For to become man, he had no need of the natural process of connubial, which is conjugal intercourse. In this way, he showed, I think that there was perhaps another mode foreknown by God for the multiplication of human beings that had, that the first human being had the first human being kept the commandment and not cast himself down to the level of rational animals by misusing the mode of his proper powers. So here we see Maximus saying, if Adam ever sinned, there would have been, you know, be fruitful, multiply, but it would have been without sex because sex is the result of sin and propagates sin. Strange idea, but again, it's teaching, teaching the saints. Now, how does this connect to Mary? Well, you might find this interesting, and we're going to see the connection in a little bit. But Orthodox teach that the Theotokos had a dispassionate conception, all right? Meaning her, her parents, Saints Joachim and Anna, didn't have passion, did not have passionate sex. It wasn't for enjoyment. I know how to say this in a not-so-crude way. It's unclear how literal we are to take this physiologically. The point is there was no passionate, lustful feelings during her conception, well, I'm going to quote a modern saint, and then I'm going to quote the saints that are earlier so you, you could see this is the same teaching. Now, St. Pius is the Athenite, book four of the family life. He's from the 20th century, wrote, the Panagia, which is a, a title for Mary, was not free from ancestral sin. She was all pure because her conception occurred without pleasure. The holy ancestors of God, after fervent prayer to God to grant them a child, conceived not by sexual lust, but by obedience to God. All right, it sets into some wacky idea from the 20th century. Well, all right, St. John of Damascus teaches this. Let me give you two snippets from chapters 2 and 6 of his oration on the nativity. He writes, O most blessed loins of Joachim, from which a holy unblemished seed was sent forth, Joachim and Anna, having kept the law of nature, chastity, you were deemed worthy of things that surpass nature. You have, been, you have given birth to the mother of God. We have St. Andrew Crete on the nativity. Um, this is, uh, I believe, book four, his fourth nativity sermon, and chapter four. He writes, what more paradoxical than to see a mother of God conceived as the fruit of a pure woman and as a virgin who sprouted from a childless barren woman who is opened but not corrupted in her womb. Now, just so you're aware, it's not because Anna had a virginal conception. That's not what he's saying. It's He's speaking of it being dispassionate. It's poetic language. Um, another early Greek writer, he's not a saint though, same century, um, seventh century, Cosmos Vestator, Sermon on Joachim and Anna, chapter three writes, a woman in who in unanimity of soul and bodily chastity always possessed constancy of understanding with her husband, thus safeguarding devout benevolence towards him in their union, right? So we see the word chastity, but they had union because there were sexual relations. St. Germanus uh, says the same thing, but I'm going to cut that out for now um, simply to save on some time. But he says that, you know, she was blamelessly born. So anyhow, Theotokos, despite the dispassion conception, had original sin. Now, some Orthodox sources actually say she was immaculately conceived. That word is actually in one of our hymns. You know, it depends how you, it doesn't just mean immaculate, it depends how you translate the word. But 
what we're speaking of is a dispassionate conception. Now, despite that, their saints that teach that Theotokos was necessarily conceived in humanity's iniquity and had flesh of sin, which was propagated from her conception. Therefore, she had a fallen human nature. This is not because she is bad. This is because she's a human being subject to original sin from Adam. So due to Mary being conceived by sex, orthodoxy teaches that Mary had original sin. The saints often teach on this subject when addressing the incarnation. So Mary had sinful flesh while Jesus took on the penalty of sin, but not the sin, therefore having the likeness of sinful flesh. So for example, um, this is Fulgentius of Rusp. He's a saint, mm -hmm. Epistle 17, paragraph 13. He writes, indeed, Mary's flesh, which humanity's iniquity she was necessarily conceived in, truly she was undoubtedly, undoubtedly sinful, was in whom God's son was given birth in the likeness of the flesh of sin. Truly the likeness of flesh of sin is within God's son, or rather it is said God's son is in the likeness of sinful flesh. It is believed the only begotten God from the virgin's mortal flesh did not extract sin's defilement. All right, so that is Fulgentius of Rusp, and he got a lot of this from St. Augustine, who in his commentary on the book of Genesis, book 10, this is in paragraph 32, wrote, Accordingly, the body of Christ was truly assumed from the woman's flesh, which is from her flesh of sin propagated from her conception. Nevertheless, because his body does not follow her conception in this same way, he is not her flesh of sin, but the likeness of the flesh of sin. So we literally see St. Augustine make the difference between Romans 8.3 and what's true of Mary and her conception. We also see this elsewhere in Augustine. This isn't against Julianus, against, yeah, against Julianus, book five, paragraph 52. Julianus said, the flesh of Christ, because he was born of Mary, whose flesh like that of all the rest came from propagation from Adam. And Augustine's beside himself, he says back to that, you dare insist there's no sinful flesh, lest the flesh of Christ also be this. Accepting his flesh, all other human flesh is sinful flesh. We see, moreover, that the concupiscence through which Christ will not to be conceived produced the propagation of evil in the human race. For though the body Mary was thence derived from sex, it did not transmit concupiscence to the body of Jesus. It did not thence conceive sexually. Right. So, in fact, the saints taught that the reason Jesus was able to voluntarily assume the likeness of sinful flesh was because his mother had a fallen human nature. So, for example, Augustine writes in the same book, book five, paragraph 62, he writes, he was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary of the Holy Spirit, that in him there'll be no sinful flesh of the Virgin Mary, that the likeness of sinful flesh be in him. Well, how did this occur? Well, St. Maximus gives us the answer in Ambiguum to John 5.16. Jesus, he says, he was free by nature from the necessity of nature since he did not owe his existence to the law of generation that applies to us. So he didn't have to have the likeness of sinful flesh. He was free by nature from that because he did not owe his existence to that. He voluntarily assumed it. Now, we know, because Maximus says elsewhere, this voluntary assumption was from Mary. He writes in 42.3 of the same book, by accepting, on the other hand, birth in the flesh, that is, by voluntarily clothing himself in the form of the slave, so as to assume the likeness of corrupted humanity, the sinless one, as if he were responsible for sin, willingly subjecting himself to natural passions like ours, but without sin. And because he is from her that he is composed, he has our parts. Now, other saints agree with this, not coincidentally. St. John of Damascus, an exposition, the Orthodox faith, again, book 3, chapter 12. God incarnate, who did not bring down his body from heaven, nor simply pass through the virgin as a channel, but received from her flesh of like essence to our own of the very same nature, which had sinned and fallen and become corrupted. Now, an even more important source is the great Eucolygian, all right, because every bishop in the first millennium, this is an eighth century prayer, it's older than that, but it's written down in the eighth century, how to say this prayer in order to be consecrated a bishop. It's like kind of like this standard manual for consecrating bishops. So in the great Eulichian, you have to confess this. I confess the word of God, co-eternal with the Father, being above time, uncircumscribed, unconfined, yet came down to our nature and humbled himself as man and took our whole fallen human nature 
from the pure and virginal blood of the only immaculate and pure virgin. We see the same thing in the tome of St. Leo the Great, great Pope of Rome. He wrote that Christ was born by a new mode of birth because inviolate virginity, while ignorant of concupiscence, supplied the matter of his flesh. What was assumed from the Lord's mother was nature, not fault. Um, the same St. Leo the Great in Sermon 22, chapter 3, writes, And to this end, without male seed, Christ was conceived of a virgin who was fecundated not by human intercourse, but by the Holy Spirit. And whereas in all mothers' conceptions does not take place without the stain of sin, this one, Mary, received purification from the source of her conception. For no taint of sin penetrated where no sexual intercourse occurred. Her unsullied virginity knew no lust when it ministered the substance. The Lord took from his mother our nature, not our fault. The same exact words from the tome. So now we know the context. So it helps to think of the incarnation mirroring the ark in the consecration of the Eucharist. Those are not aware, Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Oriental Orthodox, all believe the Eucharist is Jesus Christ's flesh and blood when it's consecrated. God is made present in a physical object which has committed no act of sin, but is made of, in the case of the Eucharist, formerly fallen matter, right? Romans 8 says all of creation groans because it's subjected to futility. So all matter is fallen, right, because of what Adam did. So the ark was seen, the Eucharist, same with Mary's flesh, but that doesn't prevent God from being present in a sinless way. So for Jesus to be incarnate and sinless, we do not need an immaculate conception. It's superfluous and contradicts the saints who explicitly taught she had original sin from her conception, as we just listened to. Now, I want to correct some misunderstandings concerning pre-purification. Someone said, wait a moment. I heard the saints taught Mary was pre-purified at conception. Well, no, you're a little confused. The saints like Pope Leo the Great talked about Mary being purified or pre-purified. This is popularly misunderstood as referring to before her conception. But as we just saw, Leo was talking about Christ's conception. The term pre-purified can refer to multiple events, and it's also an unremarkable word in antiquity. So Roman Catholic Marian scholar, Father Christian Kops, teaches in minute 4340 of his interview on patristic pillars that saints such as Palmas and Damascene understood the terms purified and pre-purified in the same sense. So to quote Kops, he writes, Palmas uses purification and pre-purification, which is really interchangeable. Damascene does the same thing. Sometimes Damascene calls her pre-purified. Sometimes he calls her purified. He is rather indifferent to it. Within the same response, Caps continues and asserts that Mary was pre-purified multiple times in her life. Later, it says the same word is used of other saints in preparation for baptism. So no scholar asserts that the term pre-purification can only refer to an event preceding her conception. It is a shame that Caps is repeatedly, repeatedly misrepresented on this point. So being that purified and pre-purified can apply to multiple situations. The question is, is when do the saints apply it to Mary? For the first 1,000 years of the church, the exclusive meaning of the term pre-purified in reference to Mary was like that of Pope Leo's. It is always in reference to a purification right before the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In the second millennium, the term's meaning became more generalized and referred to several occasions in Mary's life, including her conception, presentation of the temple, and also the initiation. Well, anyway, where's the proof that in the first thousand years this was its exclusive meeting? Well, the authoritative hymnography of the church, which is approximately from the 8th century, which means this is what was sang by all the churches it's still sang today in the Orthodox Church, and it was written before the schism in 1054 AD, exclusively ascribes the pre-purification slash purification to the incarnation. These hymns are sung throughout the Christian world, as I said before. Now, here are a few examples. St. John of Damascus in his Vigil for the Annunciation, the Great Compline, Tone 8. He writes, In his compassion and merciful love for mankind, he has submitted himself to emptying, according to the good pleasure and counsel of the Father, and has gone to dwell in a virgin's womb that has been sanctified beforehand by the Spirit. Well, some might say, well, how long beforehand? Conceptions beforehand. And Damascene gives us the answer elsewhere. In Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, Book 3, Chapter 2, he writes, so then, after the ascent of the Holy Virgin, the Holy Spirit descended on her, according to the word of the Lord, which the angel spoke, purifying her. 
and granting her power to receive the divinity of the word and likewise power to bring forth. All right, so there's no confusion as to when John of Damascus was talking about it. March 11th, Manayan, Ode 7, um, the Theotokon says, having sanctified thy soul and wholly pur pre purified thy body, thou dost give birth seedlessly, having conceived the power of the Most High in thy womb through the coming upon thee of the Holy Spirit, all, all Immaculate One. We see the word used again in the Matins for the Annunciation, Canon of the Annunciation, Ode 7. The descent of the Holy Spirit has purified my soul and sanctified my body. It has made me a temple that contains God, a tabernacle divinely adorned in a living sanctuary, and a pure mother of life. In the same um, Matins, Mary sings again in it, because you're singing like something that's Mary allegedly singing. Since then I am pre-purified purified rather, in soul and body by the Spirit, be it according to thy word, may God dwell in me. Um, we also have a very interesting hymn in the Octecos. Um, the passage I have is Friday, tone one. I can't figure out in the Greek what day this is for, but the Octecos, um, it's like the larger expanded version of the hymnography of the Orthodox Church. It says this, Having purified your soul with the light of the divine Spirit, pure virgin, you received in your belly all the light of the Father. Thus, for this reason now, expel the darkness of my transgression. So as, as we could perceive in the last hymn, Mary's purification at the Annunciation parallels our purification from transgression. So why did this purification need to occur during the Annunciation? Purification took a womb, this is the saints now, air quotes, subjected to impurity and overthrew sin, thereby keeping Jesus' conception undefiled. Now, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century in the catechetical lecture, um, there's a 12th one, paragraph 32, says, Immaculate and undefiled was his generation. For where the Holy Spirit breathes, there all pollution is taken away. Undefiled from the virgin was the incarnate generation of the only begotten. Ephraim the Syrian, in his commentary in the Diatessaron, Book 1, paragraph 25, translate, uh, that's comments in Luke 135, the Atesaron Syriac source, which combined the different Gospels. He wrote this, It was fitting that the architect of works should come and raise up the house that had fallen, and that the hovering spirit should sanctify the buildings that were unclean. He dwelt in the womb and cleansed it and sanctified the place of birth pangs and curses. Also, Ephraim the Syrian, in his um, homily, A Word Against Heretics, paragraph 19, pearls come from unclean animals. So also Christ was born of a nature that had been subjected to impurity and is in need of being cleansed by God's visitation. He also cleansed the virgin and then was born, thus having shown that there is Christ, where there's Christ, there's purity in all its power. He cleansed the virgin first, having prepared her with the Holy Spirit, where after the cleansed womb is able to conceive him. Augustine, in his responses to Max Minus, book two, paragraph uh, 17, para, uh, verse two, cha wait, it's chapter 17, verse uh, paragraph two, my apologies. The Holy Spirit first came to cleanse and sanctify the Virgin Mary, and that then there came the power of the Most High. We have St. Proclus of Constantinople in his homily on the Annunciation. From the place where the arch sinner Cain sprang forth, there Christ the Redeemer of the human race was born without seed. He was not subject to impurity by being in the womb, which he himself arrayed free from all harm. We also have St. John of Damascus on the Dormition, Homily 1, Chapter 3. He writes, the, sanctif the, the sanctifying power of the Spirit reposed on her, cleansed her, and made her holy. According to Caps, when pre-purification is used in reference to other saints, it is a reference to their baptism. So not coincidentally, we find saints referring to the Theotokos pre pre-purification during the Annunciation as a spiritual baptism. For example, St. Leo the Great, the Pope, Sermon 24, Chapter 3 says, For the earth of human flesh, which is the which in the first transgressor was cursed, right? The soil is the earth. Um, Mary's womb is like the soil, like for the new Adam, was cursed. And this, the offspring of the Blessed Virgin, only produced a seed that was blessed and free from the fault of its stock. And each one is a partaker of this spiritual origin in regeneration. And to everyone, when he is reborn, the water of baptism is like the virgin's womb. For the same Holy Spirit fills the font who filled the virgin, that the sin which that sacred conception overthrew may be taken away by this mystical washing. 
Saint Ephraim the Syrian says the same thing in Nativity Hymn 16, 9 to 11. Mary says in this hymn, Shall I call you Lord, O you who brought forth from his mother in another birth out of the water? Handmaiden and daughter of blood and water am I, whom you redeemed and baptized. Son of the Most High, who came and dwelt in me in another birth, he bore me also in a second birth. I put on the glory of him. Now, baptiz baptism redeems Mary in the same way it redeems everyone. Now, let's look at how Augustine described how baptism redeemed Mary. We got to understand Augustine's doctrine on this. So we're going to say a few short passages. And against Julianus, book three, paragraph 12, Augustine writes, we declare whoever is born must be under the power of the devil until he is reborn in Christ. Now in the same book, book four, paragraph 34, he writes, the reason those born in the union of bodies are under the power of the devil before they are born through the spirit is that they are born through concupiscence, through sex. And I want to remind you, we already read book five, paragraph 52, which said, we see moreover that the concupiscence through which Christ will not to be conceived produced the propagation of evil in the human race. For though the body of Mary was thence, that means from where, can derived. So Mary was derived from concupiscence, um, which we just learned um, is how people are under the power of the devil. Now, does Augustine make that logical derivation that all those born under concupiscence are under the power of the devil and therefore so Mary was before baptism? Well, actually he does. In book four, paragraph 122 of the same work, Augustine writes, we do not deliver Mary to the devil by the condition of her birth, but for this reason, because this very condition is resolved by the grace of rebirth. Now, Augustine is not the only saint to say this. In fact, Gregory the Illuminator in Homily 3 of the Annunciation quotes Gabriel the angel saying to Mary, no longer shall the devil be against you for where of old that adversary inflicted the wound, that's the womb, there now, first of all, does the physician apply the salve of deliverance. Where death came forth, there is life now prepared its entrance. So the preceding baptism, like the baptism of all people, the original sin, sanctified the Theotokos' mind, healed her from evil inclinations, carnal desires, and carnal passions. Now, again, those are not my words. These are the words of the saints. And for those not aware, Orthodox Roman Catholics, Oriental Orthodox, we all believe that in baptismal regeneration, which is another show, but that's why we believe it sanctified her mind. So Gregory the Illuminator, Homily to the Annunciation, paragraph 3 says, and when this word, hail, thou art highly favored, reached her, in the very moment of her hearing it, the Holy Spirit entered into the undefiled temple of the Virgin, and her mind and her members were sanctified together. St. Ambrose on Mysteries, paragraph 13, he writes, You hear that our fathers were under the cloud, and that a kindly cloud cooled the heat of carnal passions. That kindly cloud overshadows those whom the Holy Spirit visits. At last it came upon the Virgin Mary, and the power of the highest overshadowed her when she conceived the redemption for the race of men. Ephraim the Syrian in his Nativity Hymn 28, 6 to 7, says the same thing. Your, he's saying Mary's, refined conception wipes clean and dissolves the impulsive desire of your members. Holiness and purity he poured forth and filled you with holy floods. He purified you so that one would say, how good is she, that glorious woman? Since a conception is the glorious one, he stamped himself as if by a signet upon your mind. Lastly, St. Gregory the Great, Pope of Rome, Moralia on Job, book 18, paragraphs 32 to 33. He writes, By the burning effect of this scorching wind, the mind of each of the elect is cooled down when the heat of evil inclinations is extinguished therein, and the flame of carnal desires turned to ice. The minds of the righteous are brought from the irritation and heat of bad habits to coolness and quietness of the thoughts. While they now no longer seek earthly things, while they extinguish the flames of flesh by heavenly aspirations. In reference to this cooling of the soul, which is given from heaven, it is said to Mary, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, Luke 135. So I want to emphasize that God's grace prevented aberrant thoughts. Take into account that this occurred before Mary hit pure puberty, which is a very trying time in every fallen person's life. Also take into account that the Theotokos made full use of her baptism by cooperating completely with God's grace. Otherwise, it would have not achieved its purpose in, of keeping Christ undefiled.
Remember, that's not my words. So Orthodox see this as an example of her virtue, not vice, because she fully cooperated with the grace of God. If you want more detail on that, we covered that in the last show. So Mary was virgin before birth. All right, you can't see the star on this icon, but they have a star on this shoulder during birth and after birth. All right. Now, people think this is a late medieval invention. Historians affirm these doctrines were documented since the second century. Now, a historian, probably the top one alive today, is Stephen J. Schumacher, um, Mary in the early Christian faith and devotion. Um, he's the one I read him in this book. Um, I actually don't know what denomination he is. I believe he's Protestant, but this is something that scholars are aware of. So, Ascension of Isaiah 11, 12 to 14. The report concerning the child was noised abroad in Bethlehem. Some said, the Virgin Mary has given birth before she was married two months. And many said, she has not given birth. The midwife has not gone up to her. And we heard no cries of pain, right? So no pain means she didn't lose her virginity. This was not like a normal birth like that. It was not painful. Like Isaiah 66 said, second century. Odes of Solomon 19.8. And she labored and bore the son, but without pain because it did not occur without purpose. Now, here's a kind of weird one. It's from the Protevangelicum of James, 19, paragraphs 19 to 20. Um, and it's, I'll, I'll just read to you. <laughs> the, uh, then said Salome, as the Lord my God lives, unless I thrust in my finger and search the parts, I'll not believe that a virgin has brought forth. And the midwife put in her finger and cried out and said, woe is me for mine iniquity and my unbelief, because I have tempted the living God. And behold, my hand is dropping off as if burned with fire. Now, in the 4th century, St. Jerome and against Helvidius in paragraph 2, um, he affirms the same doctrine more clearly because this is now not hymns and songs and prayers. He writes, I must also entreat God the Father to show that the mother of his son, who was a mother before she was a bride, continued a virgin after her son was born. Another 4th century, St. Hilary Poitier in commentary in Matthew 1.4 says, If they, the brethren of the Lord, have been married sons and not those taken from Joseph's former marriage, she would never have been, have been given over in the moment of the passion, which is the crucifixion, to the apostle John and his mother. And very simply, Leo the Great, Sermon 22, chapter 2, says, For a virgin conceived, a virgin bare, and a virgin she remained. Now, Orthodox believe Mary never sent due to God's grace, including the, the specific aforementioned pre-purification that Thea took us throughout her whole life never committed an act of sin. Now, St. Ambrose writes in commentary on, on Psalm 118, 22 to 30, that Mary was a virgin, not only undefiled, but a virgin whom grace had made inviolate, free of every stain of sin. St. Augustine on Nature and Grace, chapter 42 says, with this exception of the virgin, we could only assemble together all the forementioned holy men and women and ask them whether they lived without sin while they were in this life. What we, can we suppose would be their answer? That's a rhetorical question. Of course, that they sinned is what he's saying. He says, even holy people sin with the exception of the virgin. Now, because she never committed an act of sin, she did the heroic acts of always turning from every assault of passion. Now, the, the saints teach that she turns from every carnal thought and passion. Now, normally, we consider this heroic with regular human beings. Now, St. John Maximovich, um, he wrote this. He said, if Mary, even in the womb of her mother, when she could not even desire anything good or evil, was preserved by God's grace from every impurity, and then by that grace was preserved from sin even after her birth, and then in what does her merit consist? If she, without any effort, without having any kind of impulses to sin, remain pure, then why is she crowned more than everyone else? There is no victory without an adversary. St. John Maximovich is a 20th century Russian saint, so he may not be very convincing Roman Catholic, but I want to tell you what Orthodox believe. That being said, um, this is also taught by early Orthodox saints, early Roman Catholic saints. They're from the first millennium. So, for example, St. John Damascus, who writes in the 8th century, she, Mary, became the home of every virtue, turning her mind away from every secular and carnal desire, and thus keeping her soul as well as her body virginal. That's in Book 4, Chapter 14 on the Exposition. Um, and on the Dermission, Homily 2, I'm going to read a sentence from chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 19. Um, you're going to need this book. It's not online. So you're going to have to get On the Dermission of Mary, but I assure you that there. The Immaculate Virgin never involved herself in earthly passions, but was nourished on heavenly thoughts. 
Mary has shaken off the assaults of passion and has planted again the shoot of obedience to God our Father. She avoids all impurity and turns away from the morass of her passions. St. Germanus on the Dormition, Homily 2, Chapter 2, same book. The Lord said to Mary, Do not be disturbed at the leaving behind the corruptible world with all its desires. The extravagant demands of the flesh, like we read about in Romans 7, will no longer disturb you. You are ascending to a fuller life, to delights free from passion, to permanent freedom from distraction. Now, some people may object to asserting that turning away from sin is not evidence of original sin. Now, however, we cannot turn away from something that we do not have some tendency for. Augustine teaches the following concerning sexual sin, but this is true of all sin. And on the Trinity, book 13, paragraph 23, Augustine writes, Incitement of sexual intercourse, if men yell to it, is satisfied by an act of sin. If not, then it is bridled by an act of refusal. Which two things who could doubt to have been alien from paradise before sin? All right, so we know that you cannot refuse or turn away from something unless you have this sinful proclivity. Without the proclivity, you're not turned away from anything. Christ never turned away from lust. We know that because uh, uh, St. John Cassian talked about that, I think, in Conference 5. Now, that aside... Some other people may object that freedom from distraction is not deliverance from the fall. However, St. Gregory of Nyssa writes on the Making a Man, chapter 27, paragraph 5, that after the fall, our minds became subject to flux and change. Irenaeus, and against Heresies, book 3, chapter 23, paragraph 5, and St. John Chrysostom in Homily 17 on Genesis, chapter 1, said that confusion enter our minds only after the fall. Now, St. Maximus the Confessor calls this gnomic willing, and orthodoxy teaches that all sin derives itself from gnomic willing. Mary had gnomic will, but never consented to sin. So how incredible is that? Despite sharing not only our physical but spiritual afflictions, the mother of God never sinned. Most of the audience finds this too fantastic to believe, but this is why we orthodox marvel at and venerate the Theotokos. Now, let's talk about Mary's struggle with the effect of sin upon our human nature no, this is not something a Protestant convert just came up with his mind. That's a quote from page 75. It can mean Gregory's full of grace, glory to thee, from the Russian Orthodox Church side of Russia. Now, as indicated before, the Theotokos was heroic in that she experienced assaults of passions and exhibited gnomic will, but never consented to sin. However, the existence of this can only be attributed to original sin. We learned that Mary turned away from carnal thoughts. What specifically were these thoughts according to the scriptures and the saints? The following saints and early church teachers taught that Theotokos experienced doubts, which are indicative of confusion or gnomic willing, and grief, which is indicative of the passions. Now, people may find this weird, but the saints teach grief is an unnatural passion because it leads to acts of sin, like suicide. If you want details on that, get asked me. We'll leave it aside for now. Now, as said before, the saints teach that she had grief and doubt, but also affirmed that the grace of God healed her in an instant preventing any consenting to sin, like despondency, faithless, faithlessness, etc. So here are examples of this from saints and early church teachers. This is Origen from homily on Luke 17, um, and he is not a saint, but he wrote, Mary too was scandalized in that moment of the crucifixion. This is what Simeon is prophesying about. Your soul will be pierced by the sword of unbelief and will be wounded by the sword point of doubt. Now, St. Basil the Great, a century later, in letter 260, paragraph 9, writes this. About the words of Simeon to Mary, there is no obscurity or variety of interpretation. So he's saying this is the universal interpretation. Simeon therefore prophesies about Mary herself that when standing by the cross, she shall feel about her soul the mighty tempest. Even you yourself, who has been taught from on high the things concerning the Lord, shall be reached by some doubt. This is the sword. He indicates that after the offense of the at the cross of Christ, a certain swift healing shall come from the Lord to the disciples and to Mary herself. Now, Ambrosiaster, which uh, most manuscripts say is uh, Hilary of uh, Poitiers, actually. Um, so this might actually be written by a saint, but there's some dispute who actually wrote this. Um, questions and answers in the Gospel of Luke, question 73. As for what Simeon adds in Luke 2.35, indicates that Mary, in whose bosom the mystery of the Incarnation has been wrought, there has been some doubt at the death of our Lord. He who ceases to doubt ceases to be subject to death. He then actually quotes the book of Revelation, says those who doubt will go to hell. And uh, Augustine writes in a catena on Luke 2.35, so this is like a book of quotations. 
By this is signified that Mary also, through whom was performed the mystery of the incarnation, looked with doubt and astonishment at the death of her Lord. And I'm going to apologize for the listeners that, yes, you hear my baby, and yes, he's very cute. St. Maximus Confessor in Life of the Virgin, paragraph 53, writes this. Grief and doubt that came upon the disciples at the crucifixion of the Lord and struck the heart of the Immaculate Mary like lightning immediately in an instant Healing and consolation were introduced by the Lord, who strengthened their hearts by her faith, so that her fortitude was made manifest. So in the proceeding, we see we can see that Mary experienced some doubt, but did not consent to this feeling. In fact, this was an example of her fortitude, which strengthened others. Hence, Orthodox see the proceeding as evidence of her virtue during an extremely trying moment, not vice. We believe this virtue was the result of God's grace, which is why we call it healing. You only need to be healed of an ailment, um, here being a sinful tendency to doubt God, which exists to original, due to original sin. So how heroic is this? Despite an ailment, she did not sin. Now, St. John Chrysostom speculates even further about how God intervened to prevent the Theotokos from sinning. In homily 4 in Matthew chapter 9, why didn't, the, why didn't the angel declare the good tidings to her after the conception? Lest she should be in agitation and great trouble, for it were likely that she, not knowing the certainty, might have even devised something amiss, touching herself, have gone on to strangle or to stab herself, not enduring the disgrace. Therefore, to prevent these things, the angel came before the conception. Now, here's another one that a lot of people um, understand wrong. This is in Homily 44 on the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read sections from chapter one and three. This is about the situation that says, "These are my Jesus teaches, these are my mother and brothers. For in fact, that which she had to do was of superfluous vanity and that she wanted to show the people that she has power and authority over her son. Whence it is clear that nothing but vainglory led them to do this. With what purpose he reproved that it was not with the intent to drive them to perplexity, but to deliver them from the most tyrannical passion and to lead them on little by little to the right idea concerning himself. On this occasion too, he both healed the disease of inglory and rendered the due honor to his mother, even though her request was unseasonable. Now, it would be inaccurate to say that Chrysostom was teaching that Mary sinned. In fact, he contradicts this. In paragraph two, he states, Neither did he declare and pronounce judgment against them, but he, he's speaking of Christ, yet left it in their own power to choose, speaking with the gentleness that becomes of him. So hence, Jesus Christ permitted his family members to be assaulted by the most tyrannical passion of vainglory, and by speaking gently, this allowed God's grace to cooperate with their wills to avoid sin. This is why it states that they were healed from the disease of vainglory. No judgment was made, which implies that sin itself was not conceived. This is not orthodox psychobabble. The scriptures state in James 1.15, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Hence, consent to a passion must occur before sin exists. Being assaulted by the passion is not a sin. It's a result of original sin, but it's not a sin. Now, a similar episode, uh, Chrysostom um, recounts in Homily 21, John chapters 2 to 3. He says, during the wedding in Cana, she desired both to do them a favor and through her son to render herself more conspicuous. Perhaps, too, she had some human feelings, for this was a reason why he rebuked her on that occasion, saying, Woman, what have I to do with you? Instructing her for the future not to, be, not to do the like, because though he was careful to honor his mother, yet he cared much more for the salvation of her soul. So the orthodox doctrine is clear. By the biblical definition, James 1.15, there is no actual sin being committed in any of the preceding examples, even in Mary's thoughts. So she is healed from every, from even aberrant thoughts before they are consented to. Well, Mary had concerns about the judgment. We're going to read now that the Theotokos had valid concerns that should be judged due to her original sin. Now, St. Hilary of Poitiers in homily on Psalm 118, verse 20, makes this comment. Says, seeing we must render an account for every idle word, do, uh, idle word, do we desire the day of judgment in which that unwearied fire is to be passed through, in which those grievous punishments are to be undergone for the expiating of a soul from sin? A sword shall even pass through the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. If that the Virgin who bore God is able, the word in Latin is capaz, like capable, is able or capable to come into the severity of judgment, will anyone dare desire to be judged by God? 
Think about that. Eve and Adam weren't capable of being judged. They committed no sin before they fell into sin. So we see this concern about her being judged in Dormition homilies. Those are stories about Theotokos' death spanning throughout the entire Christian world. This means everyone believed this. Within these homilies, we see a humility and awareness of fallenness. So the, this is now a Greek homily. It's from John of Thessalonica. Roman, he was the Roman legate during the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople III. So this is his Dormition homily, paragraph 5. He's venerated twice a year when the council fathers are venerated. Mary says, it has been revealed to me that I shall depart, and I am only afraid of the enemy who makes war on everyone. He can do nothing against the righteous, but he defeats the unbelieving and sinners. There are several quotations from a Latin text called the Transitus Mariae, which, according to Dr. Njork, is the most widely disseminated of the Western Dormition text, and it concurs with John. So this is the most popular one in the West. Mary prays in paragraph 2. I ask that you send upon me your blessing that no power of the lower, lower world may withstand me in that hour in which my soul shall go out of my body and that I may not see the prince of darkness. Paragraph three, Mary prays. Therefore, I ask of thee, O king of glory, that the power of Gehenna hurt me not. In paragraph seven, the same, Mary prays. Therefore, receive me, thy servant, free from the power of darkness, that no onset of Satan may oppose me and that I may not see filthy spirits stand in my way. And the Savior answered her. Remember, this is a Dormition homily. When I sent by my father for the salvation of the world was hanging on the cross, the prince of darkness came to me. But when he was able, but when he was able to find in me no trace of his work, he went off and vanquished and trodden underfoot. But when thou shalt see him, thou shalt see him indeed by the law of the human race in accordance with which thou hast come to the end of thy life. But he cannot hurt thee because I am with thee to help thee. So take note, Jesus met Satan as one without original sin, while Mary will meet sin in a condition contrary to his. That's the whole point of that passage. Now, this teaching also exists among the Oriental Orthodox. So this is from an Egyptian homily, uh, a pseudo Cyril Jerusalem, and the Coptic Dormition homily. And this is authoritative for the Oriental Orthodox. It contains two similar prayers. There's no paragraph, so you'll have to just read the text and link to my website. Mary prayed. The word of the Father, the word of the Father was graciously pleased to come and to rescue us from the slavery sin. So that's Mary praying to rescue us from the slavery sin. Mary prays later, let the dragon flee before me. May the fire, river of fire be tranquil when I come unto thee, and may it allow me to cross over it, for unto thee belongs the power and the glory forever and ever. So Orthodox and I believe she would have been judged for any act of sin. Remember, we believe she's sinless. But our spiritual writings portray those of humility being aware of their own sinfulness, even if they live extremely righteous lives. Hence, Orthodox can affirm the above ancient traditions that were prevalent in all corners of Christendom, right? Latin West, the most popular one, the Greek East, the guy who was actually the Roman legate in Constantinople III in the Ecumenical Council, and among the Coptic uh, Christians, the Egyptians, we have the Coptic Thermitian homily. Interestingly, and sadly, Roman Catholics cannot affirm what everyone in the whole Christian world believes due to their doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Now, Mary corrupted and died. This is significant because not only the Psalm teaches us, because if we understand original sin, bodily death and corruption come from being cut off from God's vivifying energies due to an inheritance of Adam's sin. So that's how people die. That's how they corrupt. Um, we got into more detail that in the last presentation, if you want more on that. Hence, her death is proof that she, like us, had original sin. Now, some may object and say, but Jesus died. Well, why did he die? John of Damascus teaches an, expo teaches an exposition of the faith, book 3, chapter 27. Since our Lord Jesus Christ was without sin, for he committed no sin, he who took away the sin of the world, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth, he was not subject to death since death came into the world through sin. He dies, therefore, because he took on himself death on our behalf, and he makes himself an offering to the Father for our sakes. Christ voluntarily assumed death. All right, and I could do a whole presentation on that, but we're going to leave that aside for now. Now, the question is, if he was not subject to death, was Mary subject to death? The saints teach, yes. St. Germanus on the Dormition, uh, on the Dormition Homily 1, Chapter 6. You, Mary, had a body just like one of us and therefore could not escape the event of death that is the common destiny of all human beings. St. John of Damascus on the, on the Dormition, homily 2, chapter 8, Adam and Eve, the ancestors of a race, cried out piercingly with joyful lips, 
Blessed are you, O our daughter. You inherited from us a corruptible body. Then I'm seen again, same homily, um, but the third one, chapter four. Behold, the virgin, daughter of Adam and mother of God, because of Adam, she commits her body to the earth. St. Andrew Crete on the Dormition, homily two, chapter four. She simply followed the laws of nature and fulfilled God's plan. She was moved through transformation from a corruptible state to an incorruptible one when she was bodily assumed. So there's more quotes on this, um, but in the interest of time, we're going to move forward. That Mary was bodily assumed and intercedes for us in heaven now. So we just saw that reference to bodily assumption and remission. It's in all the remission homilies. I'm going to leave that aside for now. Um, most people think that this idea that Mary intercedes for us and we could pray to her is something from the Middle Ages. Now, documents as old as the third century convey Mary's intercession on our behalf. This is not my opinion. In fact, scholars like Stephen J. Schumacher teach this. So anyhow, um, in the Ode to Solomon, um, second century. Um, now, my personal interpretation, this is about the incarnation, but Dr. Schumacher disagrees with me. Um, he says this is about the belief in intercession. I'm going to read the quote. The virgin became a mother with great mercies. Admittedly, that's vague. Well, here's a quote from the third century Gospel of Bartholomew. It's in the second Latin recension, if you're really into manuscripts, 417. Bartholomew raised his voice and said thus, O womb, more spacious than a city, wider than the spreading of the heavens, that contain him, whom the seven heavens contain not, but thou without pain is contained, sanctified in thy bosom. Now, all right, prayers, and they could be kind of vague. Do we have anything more specific? Sadly, they're also prayers, but they are more specific. Also from the third century, according to Anglican scholars, so it's not just Orthodox, this is an anaphora from Coptic basil. So this is in the Egyptian liturgy. The holy and glorious Mary Theotokos, Mother God, and by her prayers have mercy on us all. There's another fourth, a third or fourth century prayer, but that's actually when the manuscript's from. So usually if the paper's from then, the original one was lost. So it might very well be in the third or second century, but we don't know. It's a third or fourth century manuscript is this prayer. Beneath your compassion, we take refuge, O Mother of God. Do not despise our petitions in time of trouble, but rescue us from dangers only pure and only blessed one. So we have now gone the whole gamut from conception to death to bodily assumption, and now she intercedes for us in heaven. Um, for those of us in the old calendar, because the Orthodox has two different calendars, half the Orthodox, really actually less than half, they follow what Western Christians follow when it comes to Easter and Christmas and all that fun stuff. Well, not Easter, only the Finnish follow Western Easter. Um, I, in the Bulgarian Patriarchate, um, in America, they follow the old calendar. The Russians follow the old calendar. Um, those follow the old calendar. We're now in the Dormition fa uh, fast now. So all these things are very relevant because we want to have a zeal according to knowledge. We want to worship God in truth. We want to venerate the saints in truth. We have to understand that Mary is a normal human being who had great grace from God and that she fully cooperated with that grace and did unbelievable things and she's in heaven now interceding for us. So that is the Orthodox doctrine in a nutshell. Um, and if anyone has, and I just realized. Hold on, guys. Sam, did I? When did I go off? <laughs> hey, Sam. Go, go ahead, continue, brother. You ten se last ten seconds. Hello. Okay, guys, I don't know what happened. You there, brother? I'm here. I'm here. I don't know what's going on. No, you're... Yeah, we lost you. Okay, his connection is bad, guys. Your connection, brother. 
Okay, things like this happen. Sorry, oops. Brother, I don't know. You're losing connection. Are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave my camera off. It might be the camera. You, so, you cut off the last 10 seconds, what you were saying. All right, so we only lost land. Well, I'm pretty much finished. <laughs> Are you done? So you want me to yeah, open, or I guess, I guess I'm done. I've lost my thunder. Um, I'll just say this yeah. whole issue is definitely grounds for humility because I prayed before this, and I said if, um, if I'm wrong, I was praying to Mary, then have my internet connection be cut. And uh, being that we had the whole presentation oh. other than me talking off my cuff, I'll just take this as grounds for humility to keep an open mind. Always my Roman Catholic separated brethren. <laughs> okay. So there All you right. go. Hey, did you guys hear what he just said? He goes, if he's wrong, what did you pray for? Prayed for humility and that God would, uh, that God would cut off the internet connection. <laughs> but okay, I don't guys. think it was cut. I think my camera cut off. <laughs> well, actually you lost sound completely twice. No kidding. How long? Uh, for about 10 seconds. Well, twice. Well, so I, oh, hey, there I we go. We just have, we prayer. just, we just have to have humility. That's, that's yeah. all I can tell you. I don't, I don't know the mind of God. I can only try. All right. Amen. Well, that's amazing. If that's what you prayed, it happened twice. Maybe confirmation <laughs> that all of us need to tread lightly. So for everyone here, and if you guys understood the spiritual warfare that was taking place when this brother was talking, Craig, you do not believe the spiritual warfare, what I was going through behind the scenes as okay. you started talking. My precious daughter called me and it became a war. And I'm not trying to give too much detail because she's stalking my YouTube channel, trying to, uh, yeah, spiritual warfare, dude. It was unbelievable. For the past 50 minutes, I was being attacked, distracted. So, folks, that tells you the spirit realm is real, Satan is real, and he's not happy with Christians. And he's not happy when we seek the face of Jesus and seek to glorify Christ. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on all of us. May the Lord Jesus forgive every one of us where we fail him. May the Lord Jesus give us grace to correct ourselves when we're mistaken and give us the power to live holy and pure lives, empowered by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, you shield us and make us men and women of integrity for your glory in Jesus' name. Now, guys, this is the time to ask questions. Sorry for the distractions. You do not know the spiritual warfare that we are going through, even right now as we're going through spiritual warfare. Okay. All right. I'm ready for questions. So let's ask questions. Guys, please ask questions. This is your time. And guys, know the battle is real. We really need your prayers. I need your prayers. The warfare does not stop. Okay. Now, any questions? Or you guys were too shocked. Now, here's one question, I think. Here. Uh, let me see. Okay. From our brother, Ariel. Our words like most holy, most holy lady come down and help us. Have compassion on us. Bring us peace and most holy Theotoko Sevo, consistent with biblical veneration. Yeah, the question whether it's consistent. I'd say if we're going to be biblicists, I'd say only obliquely so. We do not see direct prayers to saints. We we have some indication that this was not something we've been surprised in the first century Judaism. So when Jesus says, Eloi, Eloi, Sabbath, Tani, have you say it in Aramaic, they thought he was calling down Elijah which seems they seem to have this idea that you could ask Elijah for intercessions. And we know from um, second century rabbinic sources that, you know, there were Jewish prayers to saints as well. Um, so we see it uh, addressed obliquely, just like we see um, stone piles in the Old Testament, which and the, uh, and the tombs of the martyrs and stuff are also in the scriptures. So we see that veneration is talked about in passing, but it's not something that I think the scriptures get very explicit about. We know that the saints pray. We know that they can hear prayers. Um, but the scriptures don't explicitly connect dots. Um, just like if uh, we were to say God is of one essence and three hypo hypostases, we would not find that uh, explicitly spelled out in the scriptures. We would have to um, we would have to make certain logical extrapolations from the scriptures consistent with what God has revealed to the saints. Okay, here's another question because this kept coming up. If Virgin Mary was always virgin, why does Jesus have brothers? Come on. Well, that's a great question, actually. Um, the Greek word's Adelphi. And I recommend everyone who says this to think of two things. The first thing is the church fathers are almost always writing in the same Greek of the scriptures. And so if that didn't blow their minds, 
you need to at least like take a step back. Okay, is there something maybe I'm misunderstanding the English that makes a different sort of sense in the Greek? Um, then the second thing I would point out would be you need to read the Old Testament in the Greek translation. Um, for example, um, Lot, who's Abraham's nephew, is called an Adelphi. He's called a brother. Um, it's a typical uh, Greek word for just those who are blood family. And uh, pretty much tradition is like all these guys in Galilee were cousins and second cousins and stuff like that. So there would have been nothing really scandalous by saying the brothers and sisters of Christ as Adelphi. Um, like as St. Hilary Poitier said, why did the Apostle John be given Mary? That would have been extremely scandalous if there were um, actual blood relatives uh, for her to be taken care of by. What is meant by Mary's intercession? I think that's for you. You want me to answer? Uh, well, <laughs> All right, I'll answer. You ran up to me. Right. You. That's a good question because Mary's intercession for the Orthodox is chiefly prayer. Um, we also believe the saints, whatever spiritual gifts, like there's people, gifts of healing, um, gifts of prophecy, like here on earth, right? The Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts. Read about this in 1 Corinthians 12. Um, well, when the saints are in glory or are being, more, are being divinized even more greatly by God's uh, Holy Spirit, um, they're still going to be having those same gifts. So they will also have gifts of healing and whatnot, but obviously they're not going to stick their hand on you. Um, so Mary's intercession could be spiritual gifts, like you could pray for healing. Um, you could just address prayers for her to address to her son. Um, but what Orthodox do not believe is that Mary had like maternal sufferings that were propitiatory. Um, not every Roman Catholic believes this. This is a debate within Roman Catholicism, which is thankfully losing steam. It was more popular in early, early 20th century. It was very common in the 19th and uh, really 18th, 19th, 20th centuries that these Marian apparitions would occur in the West and they'd be teaching doctrines. And some of these actually became codified um, like the Immaculate Conception. And so like Orthodox really don't have that. And so like there was no push for any belief in Mary being like a, like she intercedes in some sort of way, like she pays for your sin. We don't believe that. We just believe just like you could ask your mother for prayer. You could ask Christ's mother for prayer. And that's pretty much what Orthodox believe. Okay. There's another one. Oh no, not this one. Sorry. This was the one I was trying to get. Hold on. Can you touch on St. Ambrose and St. Augustine's commentary in Ezekiel 44 for Mary's ever virginity? Um, I'm not aware of it being translated in English, so I cannot comment on it. Okay. All right. Uh, let me see. Sorry, man. Like I said, we're both under heavy spiritual worker. Okay. Let me see. Uh, this one, I don't know. When it says Shimuni, it's actually trying to get my attention to guess you the question. Oh, okay. Craig, how sure do you feel about the Orthodox perspective of Mary? Um, I would say the answer is um, 100% because I have confidence in the church. Um, but I do want to say this. I've been Orthodox for like three and a half years, right? Um, my heart is not a saintly heart. And so do I have the same love and devotion to the saints that someone who's born Orthodox and has always been around it has? No. Um, it's something that grows in time. Um, and it's grown for me. Um, so I want to point that out because if someone's interested in converting, but saying, I don't feel this way, doing the right thing's not always about feelings. Um, anyone that's been married or has kids knows that. <laughs> so we um, can't confuse feelings with, you know, confidence in God's teachings through his people. Now, this one too, this was relevant because again, if Mary never sinned, why did Mary offer a sacrifice of two turtle doves in accordance with the law of Moses, one of which is specifically an offering for sin? Well, I believe if I'm going by memory, I don't have Luke 2 in front of me, but I think it just said like, you know, in accordance with the law, like they were just going through the motion, so to say, just like Jesus went through baptism. But I let me venture a guess. I don't have a, a, a saint's, you know, biblical interpretation in front of me, but here's my guess. Um, my guess would be just like, if you didn't commit any act of sin, but you had to, you know, you're the high priest, you didn't commit a sin that day, but you're high priest and you had to serve in some way. They had ritual washings. Just the act of being sinful requires these expiatory rites in the Old Testament, which is what we see in Luke 2. Um, and so in that sense, that's why, you know, John the Baptist, you know, kind of objected to baptizing Jesus because he, he was aware that, you know, this would be for someone that had committed sin 
or was sinful and Jesus was not. Um, so we have to see that within that context that, um, that Mary was simply fulfilling the law, but Orthodox would obviously have no objection to the idea that Mary was born with original sin and this would make, this would be a ritual uncleanliness. Hmm. Okay, guys, you got that answer. So now here's another one. If Mary was intercessor for all, why don't, why didn't Jesus mention her that I am the way and my mother? So why did he say Mary is the way with him? I, 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 I just, I mean, no disrespect to African Christian, because I know you mean this in the most, you know, heartfelt ways, but it just, that question doesn't make sense because for example, you ask your mother and other people in your church for prayers. He doesn't say, I am the way and I am everyone in your church. I mean, so the Orthodox doctrine is really no different than that. We just believe the saints pray for us now like they prayed for us on earth, which is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 6. Okay, now here's this one. A lot of people have asked about until in Matthew 125, a reference to Mary's perpetual virginity. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, St. Jerome, who, though he was a Latin father, was uh, fluent in both Greek and Hebrew. Um, he meant, He speaks about this, and he says that in the Greek, the word until doesn't have that connotation. Now you say, oh, well, that's special pleading. Well, we already know that. We know that in the English. If I were to say that, you know, Christ will be with us even till the end of the age, does that mean Christ won't be with us at some point? So we, we know it's just a matter of speech to show that, yes, he will always be with you until the second coming. So in the same way, Mary, you know, did not know her husband until she gave birth. It's to show that this was definitely a virginal birth. So that's that's really the kind of the connotation of that word. Here's this. In case Mary was a perpetual virgin, what is the Orthodox perspective on Joseph? Was Joseph a perpetual virgin too? If not, was it okay for him to have children from another woman? Um, no, Joseph obviously was not a virgin. He had children. We the Orthodox tradition is the only dispassionate couple um, was Joachim and Anna, and even then they still had sex. Okay, so that is the Orthodox tradition as well, huh? Yes. Okay. Just curiously, do, do the Orthodox believe that after Mary, Mary had a sister because of John 19.25 or that it says Mary and it says the cross was his mother and his mother's sister? Well, we believe that Mary had several family members. Like it's, I don't have it in front of me, but when you read some of these spiritual stories, some of these are pretty early when like you read stuff from Eusebius in the fourth century. Um, and he's acting as a historian. It's not really a spiritual story. You just find out like all these guys are like extended family. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, if you go to any like third world country and you go to the countryside, everyone's like related to everybody. <laughs> and that's what I see in my wife's country. So I'm, I'm presuming that Galilee in Nazareth was probably pretty similar. And, that, and that's why we they so happen to also all be Galileans and can be picked up by their accents. Okay, here's another one. Is it right to say Mary's the mother of God? I know Jesus was God, but not his body. So it feels wrong to say she's the mother of God. She was just the mother of his human body, right? We want to be careful. I know Orthodox would jump on you and call you an historian, and I know you don't mean it that way, but we just have to, two points. One, there's tons of respectable Protestants, like the late R.C. Sproul, that say emphatically she's the mother of God. Two, the word what you know the word was god and the word became flesh right the logos became flesh god became flesh right it's not god was there and the flesh was there god was the flesh and so mary was the mother of that flesh and that flesh is god that means mary's the mother of god all right here's a couple more a couple more folks let me see i just saw a good one see that's what happens when they keep going by by too fast sorry guys i'm trying to find out because if comments are going by so fast, I saw at least two more that I think would be relevant. That's okay. Yeah, you know what, brother? I don't know if I can find it. Okay. Let me see this. Okay, at this one. Uh, do people think Jesus would want Mary to see suffering while she's in heaven? How could she be happy? Then why would you believe in her intercession or ability to hear you or I? So why would God uh, trouble the saints, not just his mother, by seeing the plight of Christians on earth. Wouldn't that hurt them? Well, we got to be careful not to base our theologically theology on rhetorical questions because we see the saints seeing suffering and complaining about suffering in Revelation chapter 6. So 
we already know what the truth is biblically. Um, I would see, say also that the saints, because they're being divinized by God's energy, they are dispassionate, they have humility, um, that they could see God's will in these things. And so they glorify God for all the good right. that he's doing. Um, and so we have to see things within the lens of godliness. And uh, like the Psalm says that, um, you know, uh, blessed are the death of the saints. So this is something I think the saints would know firsthand. Now this one's directed to me. Sarah, what's wrong with you? What happened to you, Sam? I've lost my way, Craig. I, I, I'm no longer a believer, man. <laughs> just directed to me. Just, but here's one I think will be relevant because people want your notes here. Craig, were you reading off of a transcript or have detailed notes of your entire talk? Would you be able to post them all somewhere so that we can look through them? So here's the time to plug your uh, your resources, your website and everything. And we're going to put them in the description box, God willing. But people want to want these notes, Craig. Where can they find you? They could be found at orthodoxchristiantheology.com. I think it's called Orthodox Marian Doctrine of Sam Sam Hoom, um, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. So, <laughs> so forgive me. But it's orthodoxchristiantheology.com, no dashes, no dots, no underscores like that. All the citations are there. Um, it's super important. You read the citation, you read the media context, and if possible, read the whole thing. I'm not a proof texter. Uh, this was a very long presentation, and I cut out as much as I can just to try to leave the meat and no bones. But I, I cut out a lot of like good marbled meat with fat on it too. And you guys got to dig in this deeper, and that's why I leave – all the resources for you to get. You'll have to buy some books, like I said. Um, some some are only book form, but a lot of it's online these days, thank God. Okay. I've been scrolling to see. I really don't see many more questions that I think are relevant because you've answered them. And folks, again, sorry for the technical difficulties. Sorry for my end. I wanted to hear it, but thank God it's recorded. I'm going to go back and re-listen because I want to learn all different perspectives. This is where I'm at. I'm in a journey. I want to hear the best of all perspectives and trust the Holy Spirit to guide me in all truth. But it's not a coincidence two things happen. When the brothers started speaking, I started getting distracted, and the spiritual attacks were relentless. Very, very, I mean, it was on a high level. And then this man lost his internet connection for about 10 seconds, came back and lost well, to, it. To, to be fair, because God likes leaving things vague, so we wonder and search for him. My connection was never lost. It was some sort of technical area of the video, because I saw you backstage and I was, and my internet was on, but who knows? That's all I could say. We, yeah, we yeah. have to have you. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. It wasn't in there. Can I, let me, let me, let me say, I could see your logo, but then it disappeared on my end. It said disconnected. It did say that twice on my end. You yeah. could see the, the icon and then boom, it was gone. Then you can, yeah, I could do that right now. Gone. If I click on the camera, you ready? One second. Yeah. See? Yeah. Yep. See, that's what happened. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what that's exactly what happened. So on my end, I thought it was just some guy. sort of I'm on a cheap Chromebook. So right, if if I could just do it at will, you know that's how it happens. But yeah. okay, <laughs> that so folks, you know it was warfare. It was distractions <laughs> and attacks on him and me. That means something good's gonna come out of this. When Satan attacks, when Satan attacks this viciously, something good's gonna come out of this. And Satan knows it and he attacks to distract. But I want to again thank thank Craig for coming, giving us the Orthodox perspective. It's now archived. He has permission. Everyone has permission to upload these videos to their YouTube channels. Go back, re-listen, and then seek the face of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide in all truth as I'm doing. Holy Spirit, guide us, perfect us, and save us, please, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Craig. God bless you guys. Remember, Christ is risen, and he will come again. Maran Athe, we love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord be with you. God, God bless you. Thank you.